Yes, thank you. As the prosecutor finished, she said, this is shocking, unthinkable. I believe there were other use, words used throughout trial. Unbelievable, obviously unbelievable, unthinkable, unfathomable. And the reason that's the case is because it was unforeseeable. No one expected this. No one could have expected this, including Mrs. Crumbly. Now, the first thing I wanna do very quickly is talk to you about the burden of proof. In the state of Michigan, there are different burden of proofs depending on what kind of a case it is. When people sue for money and say, I've been injured, or I was failed by, by the school even, there will be civil lawsuits and the burden of proof is a preponderance of evidence. That means it's about a 50-50 standard. And if you have 50% of the evidence, that's the burden of proof for civil. When the state thinks it's important to take away a person's children, the burden goes up and the burden has to prove more evidence and that specifically is clear and convincing evidence that it's correct for the state to be taking away a person's children. Now, the highest burden in this country is in a criminal case. And that is beyond a reasonable doubt. And the reason I'm telling you about the differences in the burdens is because in a criminal case, if you have just one reasonable doubt about the case, you must vote not guilty. And so this is my poster just showing beyond a reasonable doubt is guilty, but there's many, many other options. If you think it's likely, probable, possible, not likely, those are all not guilties. You have to be sure beyond a reasonable doubt. And later, as I go through my closing, I am going to tell you the reasonable doubts that the defense believes exist in this case for you to look at. The other thing I have to ask you to keep in mind is that in the jury instructions, and I think you've been told this throughout trial, the defense does not have to prove or do anything. Like Judge Matthew said, we could sit at the table and play chess the whole time, call no witnesses, cross-examine no witnesses, provide no evidence, because we have no burden to prove a thing. However, in this case, you obviously saw the defense present Mrs. Crumley, who took the stand, so that she could give you some context beyond parts of the evidence that were confusing when the prosecutor was introducing in bits and pieces. And the problem in this case is that we can all agree everything can be seen different in two ways. First of all, when you look back in hindsight with 2020 vision, when you look back in hindsight, it is easy to say, this could have been different, that could have been different, this would have changed. And the other circumstance, the second one that makes a huge difference is when you get full context around the evidence that is being used. And in this case, the prosecutor has cherry picked little bits of evidence out of mountains of evidence to put in front of you with no context to explain what they're doing. And when you get cherry picked bits of evidence, it's easy to reach wrong conclusions. Now, during jury selection, it felt like the prosecutor was asking you questions and giving more of a campaign speech than a jury selection proceeding. And I would support to suggest to you that at the end of the day, the only judge, although Ms. McDonald mentioned she's been a judge and was a judge several times during her jury selection, the only judge in this courtroom that matters is Judge Matthews. And the only other people whose judgment matters are the 12 of you 
who will collectively decide this case. The rest of us don't matter. My opinion doesn't matter. Ms. McDonald's doesn't matter. The opinions of everyone in this audience doesn't matter. The media and all of the people who think they know everything behind keyboards at home commenting about what they think the evidence in this case has shown. <clears throat> so during this case, it's obvious real life is messy and complicated. And during this trial, I will openly admit that I'm a lawyer who messes up. I get thrown off when I'm surprised by something. I feel like I get overwhelmed when information is coming at me quickly. I say I'm sorry a lot. Evidently, there's a TikTok channel of me saying I'm sorry through this whole trial. And all I'm saying is that I'm human. I am a human being, and so is Mrs. Crumbly. And that's what this case is about. She's not a perfect person or a perfect parent. I'm certainly not a perfect person or a perfect parent. And I'm certainly, beyond a reasonable doubt, bad with technology, which is why you're not going to see me touch that laptop. So during this trial, I have stood before you and shown you all my flaws, and I embrace them, and they are a part of what makes me human. And so has Jennifer Crumbly. She got on the stand and talked about every nook and cranny of her life, things no one else in the world knew, in her family, among her friends, and she wanted you to see the whole truth, the entire truth, and nothing but the truth on everything, where she had to show you that she has made immoral decisions to have an affair, that she has made decisions you might not make to have another person involved in the affair. Now, we didn't get too far into the details, but it was enough for you to know that Mrs. Crumbly got up there and literally stripped off her armor, let the prosecution cross-examine her, and show you what happened in her messy life. And I say that with all kindness, because I'm a mess too. I saw a meme about a week ago that said, I'm trying to be a mom, trying to get exercised, stay hydrated, get enough sleep, text everyone back, and not lose my shit. And I've got to be honest, as a mom, a working mom, on most days, I'm lucky if I'm fit for human contact. I'm lucky if I've taken a true shower and didn't just grab a handful of wipes and scrub off the best I can on my way running out the door, putting on <coughs> my makeup as I drive to court in my car. Because my life is not perfect, and no one's is. And during this trial, you may have concluded that you don't like me, that you hate me. That's fine. I am just asking that your opinions about me as a person, and if you're one of the people who plans to make a TikTok about me, that you won't hold those opinions against Jennifer Crumbly and will judge Jennifer Crumbly's case based on the evidence about her and her family. And if you hate her, or don't like her, or agree with things she's done, that's okay too. You don't have to like her. You are not expected to go hang out with her when this is all over. After trial, you don't have to decide if you want to go to her house. You don't have to have Thanksgiving with her. <coughs> but when you're looking at the evidence in this case, it's important to set aside your opinions of her, or take your opinions of me, and supplant them on Mrs. Crumbly. Now, when I took on this case pretty early on, I realized 
I am Jennifer Crumbly, and I could be here accused and sitting in her spot very easily. Now, in my house, we don't have guns. I don't have guns, but I do have children. And actually, I have an oopsie baby, my fourth one. I did not want four in four years, but that's what I was blessed with. I say I'm abundantly blessed. And I have kids that seem to have no issues. And at the end of the day, they're good kids. They go to school. We have no discipline problems. We have arguments here and there, just like every family does. I have a son that wants to hang out with me very rarely, but I have no belief that any of my four children would ever harm anyone else. And while I don't have a gun, I have a large butcher block on my counter with big knives that I use when I cook, and I enjoy cooking. And at the end of the day, my kids could just as easily grab a knife without me knowing it and without me having it on my radar and walk out the door of my house and go play with their kids, the other kids on my block, granted they live farther down my block because I'm in the middle of nowhere, and my son could kill somebody with my butcher block knife that I would have never expected to happen. And if you saw the text messages that my husband and I exchanged on a daily basis throughout this past year and even years before, it would be so easy for me to be in her seat. With my kids, I don't monitor assignments. I don't look at their phones. I have no reason to. My son plays a lot of video games. My son's online talking to a bunch of people as he's playing a lot of video games. Even though he has a cell phone, I don't go through it and look at his messages every day. And as he gets older, I do know he's interested in girls. If he starts receiving nude pictures of a girl on the cell phone I own but let him use and gave him for his birthday when he turned 11, should I be held accountable for receiving child pornography if a girl sexts him over some inappropriate pictures? If my son decides He's going to send some pictures back and takes a new picture of his bits and pieces. That's a 20-year felony. Am I then responsible because he sent a picture of his penis over to some girl? So not only taking the picture a 20-year felony, but then we've got a 7-year felony for sending it over. Can every parent really be responsible for everything their children do? especially when it's not foreseeable, and this clearly was not foreseeable to Mrs. Crumbly, because there's no one in the world, including Mrs. Crumbly, who would have let a school shooting happen and let what happened on November 30th take place, not only ruining the lives of so many families and victims and taking the lives of four young people, but also ruining her own son's life and ripping his <coughs> life right from her as well. She would be the first person on the planet who would have never let that happen in a million years. So this case is a very dangerous one for parents out there. It just is, and it is one of the first of its kind. Luckily, however, this is a case where the prosecution cannot meet its burden of proof. And thankfully, it's a case where truly Mrs. Crumbly does have a defense. And this isn't just one of those stretched cases where a parent is liable for what their child has done. Now, the judge is going to tell you that you have to, if you find reasonable doubt in this case, you must find the defendant not guilty. And the law says you must have a reasonable doubt, not three reasonable doubts, not five reasonable doubts, not ten. If you have a single reasonable doubt, you must vote not guilty for Mrs. Crumbly. And when it comes to reasonable doubt, each of you 
can have a separate reason to have doubt in this case, you don't have to agree on what the doubt is. And for that reason, what I am going to do is show you all of the doubts that the defense believes exist in this matter. Some of them may speak to one juror, some of them may speak to another, but at the end of the day, if you have just one, your vote in this case must be not guilty. So the first place the defense finds reasonable doubt is in the fact that the prosecution is so desperate to prosecute this case that they admitted a mountain of evidence that quite frankly was unnecessary. Now they say to you they needed to show you, they needed to prove the manner of death. We stipulated that four people died. We stipulated that it was the most horrific set of facts you could ever imagine. We stipulated that what happened to Molly Darnell and Christy Gibson Marshall was horrible. <laughs> but this prosecution Putting that evidence on was designed to inflame you and make you emotional, strike your sympathy, and get you to hate Mrs. Crumbly, which, by the way, has been very effective for most of the media, most of the public, and for anyone who has seen information put out by this prosecutor in this case. <coughs> A second reasonable doubt comes from the fact that we know, and the evidence in this case showed, context is key. And that was clear when Detective Wagrowski took the stand and said, you get better decisions when you have more evidence and testified that in a former hearing, he messed up because he didn't have the video from before the one he saw, so he believed the parents arrived at the school together and subsequently when given more context showing more video from further beforehand he could see they actually arrived in different cars met and walked in the building together and at the end of the day the more context you have the more accurate you can be when brian maloche testified another example came about where the prosecution had him testify that Mrs. Crumley said to delete his messages, clear your cache. And I'm, th I'm so thankful that the rest of the world sent me emails that I don't know how to pronounce cache because now I do. And when Brian ended up seeing the messages before clear your cache and after clear your cache, he realized, Oh, she wasn't asking me to delete messages. She wanted me to refresh my web browser to see if the Facebook had actually deactivated. And so that was proof again that when you have more context, you're more accurate. And the problem the prosecutor is in this case is they have very little con or context for the very little evidence they've submitted. There's also no context around some of this little bits and pieces of useless evidence, like Jennifer Crumbly saying that her son was an oopsie baby. I call my son that, so what? Does that mean I hate my son? Does that mean I, w I would be okay if he went and killed a bunch of people and or if he committed suicide? No! Calling your child an oopsie baby was designed to try to make her look bad with no context. Having Amanda Holland come in, a coworker who's not a friend to Jennifer Crumbly and has been interviewed by law enforcement to tell you her advice on she should go have a mother Sunday with her teenager, so irrelevant when she's faced with raising toddlers every day. When I heard her advice, I thought, yeah, right. I have three teenagers. I almost have a fourth. And, and personally, not only would they rather do anything else than spend a day with me, I'd rather do anything else. And we do spend time together, but that's not their first priority when they get to pick what they're going to be doing. It does not mean she loved her son any less if she ever told a witness, my son is weird. And part of what made me realize I could be in Mrs. Crumbly's shoes 
is I have sent my texts, I have sent texts to my husband saying, our daughter is a psycho today. On the way to school last week, she's crying. She doesn't have people to sit with at lunch. I texted him, she's a nutcase. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this. I don't have time for this. My other daughter is complaining about her lights flickering in her room. I texted my husband, this starts like, this sounds like a case. The start of a case. My husband works for my office. He's actually my office manager, so he knows about the case. He went in her room and figured out in five minutes, it's because when she flips her blow dryer on, one of our plugs makes the lights flicker. So this ghost that you would read about in my text messages, which by the way, I did not respond to, despite the fact that it's on our six family, six person group chat, was taken totally, would be taken out of context and make me look like I don't really care that my daughter is crazy. I also got texts one day, we have no food in our house, I am absolutely starving, you are the worst mother ever. And you know what I did? I ignored it. She was mad we didn't have the right kind of chicken ramen. When we have 80, not 85, I like the number 85, when we have four other flavors of ramen, and there's about a hundred other things she can eat, and I knew she's not going to starve to death, but taken out of context, it makes me look like a neglectful mother. But if you know all the circumstances, and you know the relationship I have with my daughter, I knew it was an overdramatic, stupid point. So when you see messages from Mrs. Crumbly's son saying, will you at least call back? Those are so out of context. And when I'm driving home from court every day, I'm getting messages, will you at least call back? And I don't, because I know what they want is for me to run through the McDonald's drive through and bring everyone a Coke. I do stop and get myself a Coke, but I am not getting a round of drinks every day for everyone, and I've realized it's easier to not answer the phone. So you can find reasonable doubt from the context that the defense did actually provide. And when Mrs. Crumbly got on the stand and explained to you her understanding of ghosts and dishes flying and laundry flying, that is evidence and that is something that can create reasonable doubt to hear what was really going on. Even if you believe the prosecution's dates about what was going on, it's not strong evidence, it's very misleading, and I'm gonna go through what it does show. There are three sets of dates involving Mrs. Crumbly all for March of 2021. The first time is March 8th and 9th. They in introduced exhibits, including text messages on the 8th, where Mrs. Crumbly starts off asking, is he home yet, is he home yet? I don't want him to do anything stupid. I'm sure you all remember those. Then they introduced evidence on March 9th that she went to the barn that day with her husband on the 9th. Then they introduced evidence, and I will give them credit, they put together quite a case, although it's, it's really not important, that there was a picture of the horse taken at the barn that day, that the data supports there was a picture of the horse taken at the barn that day, and that there was GPS tracking information supporting that she was at the barn that day. Okay, fine. So on March 8th and 9th, there's concern that Ethan's, I'm sorry, the shooter, the Mrs. Crumley's son is making weird comments and on the 9th she goes to the bar and she takes some horse pictures. That's all that shows. Pretty minimal. Next they went to March 16th through 19th, which was broken up into a million exhibits that quite frankly were out of order, threw me off my game, helped create these beautiful TikToks, and I'm going to tell you what they show. Now these ended up all being admitted as exhibits, but I'm going to go in order of what they show. <coughs> there was a text thread in Exhibit 85, which if you want to look at it, you can, where Jennifer Crumbly said, I'm going to get drunk and ride my horse. 
This was on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. A lot of people have a cocktail on St. Patrick's Day. That does not make her a mother that would be negligent or grossly negligent to her child. There's text messages from the day before where Mrs. Crumbly's son is saying some things about, now the house is haunted. Some weird shit just happened, now I'm scared. I got some videos, a picture of a demon. It's throwing bowls. I'm not joking, it fucked up the kitchen. I'm going to outside for a while. Can you at least text back? On that day, Mrs. Crumbly didn't text back, but their own exhibit, okay, which is exhibit 83, so the numbers do bounce around, so we go from 85 to 86 to 83, show that within an hour of the shooter making these ghost comments, she did call him. <coughs> Specifically, she called him back at 7.24, and they had a 19-second phone call. If it was 19 seconds, it most likely was, I'm on my way home, we'll talk when I get home. So then, the state, in order to make it seem like they've really, really got some proof here, they admitted exhibits 87, which show on the 17th, on St. Patrick's Day, James was on a horse, they showed People's exhibit, exhibit 88, confirming the metadata that James was on a horse. They showed a picture, 89, of Jennifer on a horse that day. Metadata to prove she's on the horse that day. A picture, another picture, number 91, of James on the horse, a different picture. The metadata to prove James is on the horse. A picture of Jennifer with her horse in Exhibit 93. And again, the metadata to support the picture was taken out at the barn and sent and that these people talked about these horses. <clears throat> You're so fine. That's on the 17th of March. You're going to have access to all this evidence if you want to see it. Then they introduced Exhibit number 86, which is where... Their son says the house is haunted. This is on the 17th. This is the day where he says, can you text back? This is the day where I already showed you the exhibit. She called him. She didn't text back, but she called him. And then they show a couple texts from a few days later on the 19th, where it's obvious from the messages, the Crumblies had had an argument with their son the night before. He was upset to have his phone and things taken away that Jennifer Crumbly gave him a melatonin to go to sleep. She should have only given him a half. It's in the messages, but she gave him the whole thing. And it knocked him out and he slept in the bed, their bed that night. And when he woke up the next morning, James described him in the text messages as he woke up looking like he had way too much to drink last night, complaining about a headache. Jennifer says, well, he was really worked up and out of control, so I can see why, talking about his behavior during the fight. All I know, Jennifer says, he needs to eat, go to work, work hard, not complain, and he can get his stuff back. She testified that getting his stuff taken away is his trigger. It's what makes him go get upset. She says, you respond, and I didn't get it. James says, Jesus, yes. He said, let me ask you a question. Why am I in your room? That's when they talk about the melatonin. She says, oh my God. James says, I really thought you were giving him a Xanax last night. Jennifer says, does he seem better? No, melatonin. James says, I know. So obviously he's joking. Jennifer writes, but he hasn't had one before, so I should have only given him half. James writes, well, he's doing his school, says his head's hurt, so he took Tylenol. Jennifer asks, is he okay to work? James says, yeah. Does he remember what he did? James finally says, dude, I'm working. I'm on a demo right now. I haven't talked to him. He's doing school. And that's really the extent of the conversation. So fine. So one day, they get in an argument. And I'll tell you what. 
those kind of arguments in a heartbeat could have me sitting in her chair. The final date that the state claims Mrs. Crumbly had knowledge about back from March of 2021 are Exhibits 96 through 100. And 96 starts off with their son saying, I'm picking up the room. I cleaned until the clothes started flying off the wall. This stuff only happens when I'm home alone. I pick the clothes back up, though. And that's the important part of those texts on the 20th. We know on that date, because the people proved it, no pun intended, but they beat a dead horse, that at 97, it's a picture of Jennifer at the barn. We've got the metadata showing Jennifer was at the barn. We've got another picture on 99 showing Jennifer was at the barn. And exhibit 100, Jennifer was at the barn. Big deal. Jennifer's at the barn. Their son is saying goofy stuff. Jennifer gave you the context. They had an Ouija board for a couple months after Christmas of 2020. He and his friend are playing with the Ouija board. They ultimately lost interest. They stopped doing it. Jennifer admitted to you one day to mess with them. She turned the power off in the house, turned the circuit off to mess with them. She mentioned a time where James pretended he was getting electrocuted. She didn't know what to do. She's <laughs> screaming, trying to kick him, see if he's electrocuted. Ethan is laughing, taking a video of the whole thing. This family played together. They had fun. They did what families do. The prosecution just had zero context because they had tunnel vision that she was doing something wrong and was grossly negligent and they were hell-bent on convincing you that was the case. So the other thing that you can find as a reasonable doubt in the case is the lack of evidence in the case as a whole. The prosecution has made very serious <coughs> claims. And when you really look at it, they have very little evidence. So what they've shown to you, and I have it in these folders, are these dates in March 2021, which, by the way, are 10 months before the shooting even took place. They're before it would have... I, I, it's unreasonable to expect that things that happened in March of 2021 are an indicator that 10 months later their son's going to do something. It would be very different if every week there was something going on up until, up until the shooting, but there's not. Because if there was, the prosecution would have brought that in and showed you every horrible thing that was happening to show you their son was being ignored and they don't have the evidence. So what they did provide and what was admitted, this is exhibit, I believe, 423. These are all the Facebook messages between James and Jennifer. So when you look at those Facebook messages and consider, and this includes the photographs and the GPS stuff, that they're using this much compared to this much over the period between January 2021 and the shooting, this is a very little, little bits in time compared to the grand scheme of things. And while the officer testified and played games with me that he's not sure this is the best evidence against mother, you better believe if they had better evidence, they'd be up here showing stronger and better evidence. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. It's obvious from the evidence in trial, and you may find it to be a reasonable doubt, that the Crumbly son was a skilled manipulator, and they didn't realize it. He's not sick. He doesn't have a mental illness. He's had no history of hallucinations. He has never shown his parents signs of mental illness. <coughs> he certainly never showed signs of mental illness wanting to get a gun. No parent would purchase a weapon 
if they believed their child had mental illnesses. And these are people that had two other guns in the house for months where nothing ever happened with those guns. They had no reason to believe that somehow this third gun was the thing that was going to make the difference. The texts that the prosecution admitted as Exhibit 101 were texts between the shooter and his friend that we have not named. The extent of these text messages saying goofy things like, I told my dad to take me to the doctor, he gave me pills to suck it up, it's at the point I'm asking to go to the doctor, I'm having insomnia and paranoia, I'm calling nine I thought about calling 911, but my parents would be pissed. I don't disagree with the prosecution that these are alarming messages, but clearly the shooter's friend isn't that alarmed because he's not texting back. The shooter's friend knows there must be more going on because he doesn't tell Mrs. Crumbly, who is like, and he's like a second child to her, and we have no other context about these messages. And if anything, the evidence does not show that Mrs. Crumbly ever saw these messages. Now, when she sees them now, she thinks, that's crazy. She'd like to know more context. But you also have to know, and another reasonable doubt you may find in this case, is created when you compare these text messages that were sent that have alarming things between Ethan and his friend to all of the messages between them, which are over 20,000. And what you would have to believe, and what I would believe, is that if the state had stronger evidence, they would have paraded it up and we would have been seeing a lot more of these. But instead, they were admitted, and you haven't heard the friend testify, you haven't heard any context about these, and all you can see, and, and really all the evidence shows, is that there's no reason to believe Mrs. Crumbly ever saw them. I don't want to have another leaning tower of pizza. I've taken your advice. Now, the other evidence the state has shown are little bits and pieces from the shooter's journal that are quite alarming and disturbing. But again, Mrs. Crumbly says the information in there about my parents won't listen to me for help is not true. And she, there is no evidence to show she ever saw that 22-page handwritten document. She never saw the little bits of evidence that the prosecution admitted To evaluate this case, you have to look at it from the perspective of what she knew. So the journal information and the small amount of text compared to all the text <coughs> with his friend are things she didn't know about. There's also two times where the state says that they have proof that Mrs. Crumbly's son was showing signs of depression or being sad or lonely. All right, those come from <coughs> April 29th, 2001. This is when Jennifer Crumbly emails the, shoot, the friend, his mother, and all she says is that her son has been acting kind of depressed. She doesn't know what's going on. She's trying to find out what's going on, but he won't really tell her much. She's trying to find out if there's an issue between the two boys she should be aware of. She's trying to get down to the bottom of it. If anything, she's doing what a good mom does to try to figure it out. But the worst of what she says is that he's stressed by school. He's a I don't want to get this wrong. He's been acting kind of depressed. And she's happy to hear it's not an issue between them. 
Then they go on to make plans for their son. This was admitted as Exhibit 104. If you put my texts up there and showed every time I told my mom that one of my kids was acting depressed or weird, I guess my favorite <coughs> word is moody these days, it would look like my kids were complete lunatics. I'm actually shocked Jennifer Crumbly doesn't have more texts about her son acting like a typical teenager. And Jennifer Crumbly testified that although she said that, she didn't think it was anything she needed to run to a doctor about or anything she needed to do anything more with. And this moment passed because if it didn't, the prosecution would have brought in all the texts that went beyond this and there would be more evidence. They also run in text with the same parent of the friend from Exhibit 105, the friend's, the, sh the friend's mother, when Jennifer Crumbly reaches out to her saying she had no clue what they were going through with their son and she felt really bad about it and asked how they're all doing and that they're thinking about them, that family, a lot. And ultimately, the worst that Jennifer Crumbly says about her son is, I know my son misses him. And if you need anything at all, don't hesitate to ask. That's it. It doesn't go on with wild depressions or hallucinations or mental health issues. That's it. That's it. I'm actually shocked there's not more instances of depression or moodiness or moodiness where my kid is acting weird. The fact that there's this little evidence is, is shocking to me. However, it's a lack of evidence on the state's part. There's also a lack of evidence in Mrs. Crumbly saying he's depressed to really anyone else. Even after the shooting, when she's testified or when she's talking to her friend Kira, to other people, to Brian, all she keeps saying over and over is, I wish there had been signs. I wish there had been something. He's a normal kid. There's a complete lack of evidence of mental health concerns specifically. If you want to really spend some time digging into this, you can read all the messages between James and Jennifer Crumbly, all, all of them, and you will find that there are not texts that go on and on that their son was exhibiting anything close to a mental health concern. And again, my texts would read worse because I say things like, I think my daughter's psychotic. When Mrs. Crumbly did have to evaluate what's going on with her son and there was something alarming happening, she relied on people who spend day in and day out with kids, people she considers to have more expertise in kids than she does, including Pam Fine, who left her a very nonchalant voicemail that you've heard, it was Exhibit 115, if you want to hear it again, saying Ethan was looking up bullets in school today. It's not illegal. It's not wrong. He's not in any trouble. It's just like how teachers can't look up hops for beer. You don't need to call me back. She was relying on the representations by the school counselor, Sean Hopkins, who took the stand and has had a lot of training, hundreds of hours of training, and made it very clear this was just an issue where he needed some kind of therapy and didn't think it was necessary to suggest to the Crumblies, go to Common Ground today, or serious enough that he called 911. <clears throat> and she relied on the assistant team, who also has an abundance of experience, experience Mrs. Crumbly doesn't have. And quite frankly, my kids didn't come with a handbook, and my guess is her son didn't either. And the assistant dean said the same thing in the meeting with Mr. Hopkins, that Ethan Crumbly could relate, I'm sorry, that the son could remain in school that day, that he would probably be better off, according to Mr. Hopkins, around peers versus being alone, 
And that as long as they got him an appointment within 48 hours for some kind of counseling or therapist, that was sufficient. So it's absolutely not credible when a witness from the school, like Mr. Hopkins or Mr. Ejack, gets up on the stand and says, even if a kid is very sick, we cannot force them to go home. That is not true. And as parents, with common sense, you should know that's not true. Because when my kids are puking, my kid's school will not let them be there. And when they have a temperature, not only can they not be there, but my children's school is always nice enough to remind me they can't be there for the next 24 hours, which means they can't be there the next day either. So reasonable doubt can be found in the fact that trained professionals told Mrs. Crumbly her son was not a risk. And Mrs. Crumbly relied upon it. This school also failed to even really look at the situation and tell her about things from the year before. They made it very clear that he was not in any kind of discipline issue, which is shocking to me and was shocking to Mrs. Crumbly, considering he's off topic looking at bullets in school. He's looking at a video in school of some kind of violent pictures, and then he draws a gun on his math paper instead of doing the gun, the, instead of doing the math paper. So when, when school officials say, okay, this is really not a big deal, all we want is a counselor within 48 hours, Mrs. Crumbly took that as a very strong sign that things were fine. And reasonable doubt can come from the fact that those three people at the school, Fine, Ejack, and Hopkins, are mandatory reporters by CPS who would have reported if they thought Mrs. Crumbly or Mr. Crumbly were neglecting their son. Mrs. Crumbly even commented to others about the nonchalance that was at that meeting, that it was only 12 minutes long, which surprised her, that she was disappointed they didn't take it more seriously, that she was surprised there was no disciplinary action, and she left the school actually feeling better that maybe she had overreacted when she flew over to the school. Now, the People who are trained in these areas, they didn't just say we're not trained in these areas. They gave specific examples. They said that kids who are really a threat, they would show nervous behavior. They would show anxiety about somebody else handling their belongings. In this case, the shooter was cool as a cucumber as Mr. Ejack went down, got his backpack with the gun in it, and brought it to him. And most, and Mr. Hopkins and Ejack said they hoped they could get him into counseling today, but ultimately said he can stay at school and we'll give you 24 hour, or 48 hours to get it situated. All right, so the prosecution keeps harboring on the fact that, harping on the fact that Mrs. Crumbly knew they had bought a gun and that the people at the school didn't. This is Oxford Community Schools. These professionals testified about how common guns are at the school, so common, and this kind of blew me away, although I live out there, that students are known to go to the gun ranges often, that girls on homecoming wearing their short little party dresses they wear to the dance take photos before the dance holding their guns, that kids go hunting on Late Start Wednesday before they go to school and the school has to give reminders to parents for people to leave their guns at home. So this school that obviously has a strong gun culture going on that sees a student looking at bullets, looking at a video game type thing with violence, and seeing a gun drawn on a paper that these school officials, knowing that community, that they didn't ask if he had a gun, 
when they carried the backpack down and did make a comment about how heavy it was, although the comment evidently was made to a different teacher, and I misunderstood and thought it had been made to the shooter. So yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly, they didn't mention the gun, but they did mention that they had been at the shooting range with their son. And this is a community that is so into guns, I can't even believe that these girls, I always look at those pictures on Facebook and think, oh my God, how short are those dresses? And these are girls showing their dresses with their guns in their hand. They know this is a gun community. Reasonable doubt can be find for, found from the fact that the biggest concern at the time was suicide and not homicide. The worst case scenario that was presented would lead a reasonable person to believe there was a possibility of suicide, not homicide. The prosecution seemed to also carry on about the amount of money and time that Mrs. Crumbly spent on horses. Just because she spends money and time on horses doesn't mean she doesn't love her son. And the fact that they have to stretch so much can create reasonable doubt. And if you actually look at the exhibits the defense submitted, you'll see that Mrs. Crumbly said she has to get a second job to pay for the braces, which are very expensive to put on her child's teeth. She paid for her son to be a part of a bowling team. She paid for him to do other sports. She, she cared about her son. Just because she cared about horses and bought medication from them and, and, and had a horse hobby, that's not any different than a dad who likes golf and buys new golf clubs and has a membership to a country club and spends time there and spends money at the bar there on days they go golfing. It's not any different. To try to suggest that it shows the priorities were on horses and not their son is just garbage. This is a son who had everything he needed and all kinds of opportunities in life. A son they take camping and on vacation to Cedar Point. Not only do they take him, they take a friend with them. These are parents that clearly love their child. They're sitting there playing board games with him, spending time doing that. That's all in the Facebook pictures that were admitted. Those are submitted to you as exhibits, and you can take a look at them if you want to. Brian's testimony in this case absolutely creates reasonable doubt. When Brian Meloj testified, there's no question he was inconsistent. And I would submit to you that after, there was no reason law enforcement needed to interview him for two hours, one hour, and then three hours. But over time, the police certainly caught on to the fact that the more you ask Brian the same question over and over and he realizes he's not giving the answer you like, he changes it. And while the prosecution tries to make it sound like, well, he didn't want his affair outed, from the very beginning, he told them he was having the affair with Mrs. Crumbly. That was not something that ever changed. It wasn't until the third interview when they started talking about his pension, talking about his job, that he felt pressure. He agreed with the word pressure, and he agreed with the word, word veiled threats, although he did take it back later, that the police wanted him to say something bad about Mrs. Crumbly. And I would submit to you that they probably did that to all of the witnesses in the case. But Brian Malosh was the one who admitted to it. And when Mr. Keast got back up there and asked him more questions and asked him more questions, Brian got right back in line like he was supposed to and told them exactly what he knew they wanted to hear. Brian is a terrible witness. He said he had memory problems. And quite frankly, when he's testifying that he knows that the gun was in the car that day of the shooting, we all know no one thinks that's true. Mrs. Crumbly testified and explained the day the gun was in the car. Brian's just wrong. And when Brian testified 
that Brady was gone and he believed Brady died or committed suicide, I would submit to the jury that Brian is just an idiot and has no clue. And that the truth is, he didn't know the details about where the shooter's friend went. He just knew he went away. Wherever he got that suicide idea from, who knows? The prosecution didn't show any texts or anything to support that. But it's clear that Brian Maloche has been put on a mission, which is you're coming into court, you've got some things hanging over your head, and we want you to take a position against Mrs. Crumbly. And I would submit to you that if you read the 77 page exhibit that I got yesterday and went through in painstaking detail with you, you can see that Brian Maloche did not think of Mrs. Crumbly that way when he knew her and when he dealt with her. And he testified the only places he got new information about her that made him think differently about his answers were from law enforcement and were from the media. The media that we have talked about in this case repeatedly as being inaccurate. Brian admitted that when the prosecution asked him, and we've already talked about this, to delete his messages, when I went through the part about clear the cache, Jennifer telling him clear the cache, showed him the stuff before and after, he realized it was just to refresh the page to see if Facebook had deactivated. So giving him little bits of information is particularly dangerous because he's not the sharpest. And that's what the prosecution did. They used him to their advantage to try to make it sound like they have this case and all these horrible statements against Mrs. Crumbly. And by the way, when they presented evidence that Mrs. Crumbly is deleting texts and keep making it sound like she delect, selects different texts here and there, it actually sounds like Mrs. Crumbly deletes all her texts, as she testified, that when people start flooding her with text, she deletes entire threads at a time. Who knows what she's deleting? We saw her on her phone flipping through them super fast. And the texts, ultimately, that she deleted, the prosecution did point out two of them in their closing. They pointed out the texts about, we're fucked, and we're on the run again. But they didn't mention that she deleted two texts that are actually, actually very exculpatory and helpful to her. Why would she delete some of the most helpful and exculpatory things she said? Those two texts are on page 42 and 44, if you want to see them in the 77-page exhibit. And those two texts confirm, she calls it the string lock was on the gun. She means the cable lock, but she doesn't know enough about guns to say cable lock. The string lock was on the gun. And the other deleted text that the prosecution didn't mention was when she said that the weapon had been locked, the ammunition had been stored separately, and that everything was not loaded. There's no reason she would delete two messages that are that helpful to her. She's just a person who deletes all of her messages as she testified to. You can find reasonable doubt that Mrs. Crumbly's state of mind is very obvious in statements she made after the shooting. Right away, she's talking about how she had no signs to believe anything would happen. At the substation interview, it's on recording, we watched it. She tells the interviewer, I had no signs, there were no signs. Then when they have her in the car, the squad car, and she's in the back, she says to them again, I had no signs. In her text message with Kira, which was admitted, she says there were no signs. Kira says there probably were, you just missed them. With Brian Maloche, Mrs. Crumbly says again, there were no signs. I would submit to you, this is not some master plan where Mrs. Crumbly decides she's going to suddenly say there's no signs. First of all, there's no evidence of signs Mrs. Crumbly knew about. And second, all of her immediate fast statements in a time of stress, went right after she's had guns held to her face, walking out the front door of her house, 
She's saying there were no signs. You might find, and I know the prosecution takes issue with this one, but Mrs. Crumley was actually, in fact, a hypervigilant mother. Um, she's the kind of mother who is going to her the friend's mom to chase down why he's having a moody and kind of depressed day. She's on power schools on the app multiple times a day checking for missing assignments. She's emailing teachers about grades. Christy Gibson Marshall, the assistant principal who did do one of the bravest things I've ever seen, she testified she saw the shooter's face and couldn't believe it was him. And the reason she couldn't believe it was him is because it was so unforeseeable. Mrs. Crumley's hypervigilance also comes when you look at how she takes him for medical appointments. They're at the urgent care because some little mole on his back changed colors when she's applying sunscreen. I think of myself as a hypervigilant mother, and I've never noticed any moles on my kid's back. And I must need to go home and look. Because when I look at the actions of Mrs. Crumley, she actually pays far more attention to that kind of thing and other things than I do. I could easily be sitting in her chair. When her son's experiencing headaches and medical issues, she's at the doctor or doing virtual visits. There's no reason to believe that's not true. With the headaches, they go through a whole process. She gets a whole x-ray done of his head. She takes him to the eye doctor to see if that's causing the issue. Ultimately, she pays and puts braces on his teeth. Then, he's a bad brusher, so she's going to the extent of getting the braces off his teeth so he can get the cavities fixed, 13 cavities. I would go crazy on my kid, and she's just doing each thing she needs to do as a hypervigilant mother. And yes, a hypervigilant mother can have a drink once in a while. I'm a hypervigilant mother, and I not only have a drink once in a while, but sometimes I've been known to have two, or three, or maybe a bottle. Reasonable doubt can be found from the fact that Jennifer Crumbly did her best as a mother. While going to the shooting range is not her thing, she's trying to find a way to bond with her son, who has just had his best friend move away. She took him camping, took him on trips, brought the second son along like I've already talked about. She let him have pets. He has the cutest little kitten you've ever seen in these Facebook pictures. Board game nights with him. She's not neglecting him in any way. And if anything, she's going to the gun range for him, not because she enjoys it. You can tell how much she loves it when she gets up there, shoots a couple shots, and then just stands there letting him enjoy the activity he likes. And I do the same thing for my kid. He likes to go to skate parks. I would rather do anything but go to the skate park. But I sit there and watch and say, oh, that was amazing. And all I hear is, mom, watch this, mom, watch this, mom, watch this, and I would rather do anything else. But Mrs. Crumley on that day is trying her best to bond with her child and have a relationship. Showing the pictures of the messy house was just not necessary. And the prosecution explained to you they weren't trying to prove she had a messy house, but much of it was just so unnecessary that I would suggest they are trying to make her look bad. They do kind of make her look a little bit like a hoarder. But if you saw picture, <coughs> pictures of my house right now, like a snapshot in time, you'd be just as horrified. I've been so busy getting ready for this trial, ready for all the fun we've had in the court and through these last <coughs> few weeks. I still have my Christmas trees up. I was complaining to my husband the other day, oh my God, we still have our Christmas trees up. This is embarrassing. And he said, hey, Shannon, we still have ceramic pumpkins up. And I realized, oh yeah, all of our fall decorations are out too. And right now I have piles of laundry all over my kids over Christmas break put together stacks of stuff I need to take to the Salvation Army. 
Um, I have donations of my own that need to go. My house right now, if they did a search warrant today, would look just as bad as Mrs. Crumbly's, and it says nothing about me parenting my child. If anything, when I come home from work, I make a deliberate decision. All right, listen, I can run around this house for three hours and try to get as much as I can done, or I can sit on my couch and watch old episodes of the Kardashians with my daughter. And I believe my time is better spent hanging out with her, watching trashy TV, than cleaning up my house because I get a chance to spend time with her. And Mrs. Crumbly was the same kind of mom. She was waiting until the holidays to have more time. She said she was going to clean her son's room. I would be screaming that I would make my son clean his room, but regardless, the project coming up was going to be to get those rooms in order. But at that point in the year when the holidays are coming up and you're getting ready for all of it and going through Thanksgiving, it does get to a point where you do have boxes piling up and you're just trying to get through those last days of school to get to Christmas break. There's reasonable doubt when you look at what Mrs. Crumbly thought after the meeting with Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Ejack. The state of mind she was in and her thoughts and what she was thinking come in through her statements. She thought everything was way less of a big deal when she left that meeting. She thought leaving him in school with his friends was the better decision based on Hopkins saying peer support is a good thing. She thought making him an appointment was sufficient within an appointment within 48 hours was sufficient. That doesn't even mean the appointment was going to be within 48 hours. Reasonable doubt can be seen in the video when Mrs. Crumbly first sees her son at the substation. Her reaction to seeing him in this complete state of disbelief as to what's going on is to look at him and say, why? Why? She doesn't look at him and say, I knew you were going to do this. She doesn't look at him and say, see, I knew we shouldn't have bought that gun. She says, why? Why? And when he says, take care of Dexter, she cannot believe that's her son and goes back into the other room with her husband and says, what the fuck? He didn't even care. And while the prosecution asked questions about, well, she's not sobbing, and we hear sobbing, and that's clearly James. James is sobbing. When you look at the video, if you decide you need to see it, Mrs. Crumbly is dabbing her eyes and wiping her eyes. And fine, she's not the crier some other people are. Reasonable doubts can come from the statements in the heat of the moment at the substation when Jennifer Crumbly is in a state of shock trying to answer their questions. She says, he's never done anything bad. This is after she's already, she already has somebody saying you really should have a lawyer there. She's still just talking about what the truth is. He's never done anything bad. One of the parents says he's a perfect kid. Jennifer Crumbly tells them the most of an issue he ever has is anxiety over tests. Jennifer Crumbly tells them everything was fine this morning. <coughs> in the statements Jennifer Crumbly made when she was in the car and doesn't even know yet if there has been fatalities, she says he's never done anything. She acknowledges he ruined lives today. She says it's the first time I've ever seen him done it, do anything. She says he's a good <coughs> kid. He's never angry. He's mellow. He's not what he looks like. He's not a monster. And she's not a monster either. She explains to them in detail when they ask, he's never had mental issues. In those moments, she can't even think straight about life around her. She's worrying about a horse and her job and all kinds of random stuff. And ladies and gentlemen, when emergencies happen, life doesn't just stop. So the fact that she's able to function and think, I still need a job, I need some money, I need a phone that works, that doesn't mean 
She thought her son would terrorize and kill people and shoot people at a school. Her reaction when she finds out there are fatalities was genuine and honest, and she broke down crying, although she does continue to keep answering their questions. She explains why she feels like fatalities are different. She explained that on the stand. If he had <coughs> shot people and injured them, it was something they could at least deal with. But a fatality is a fatality and can never be changed. The prosecution's attempt to misconstrue Jennifer's entire demeanor is a reasonable doubt in this case to show they don't have a strong case. They keep saying she's not sad. Jennifer explains she went into what can I do mode. She did show sadness if you read the texts between her and Mr. Maloche. She showed sadness in the way that she shows sadness. And for these officers to get up on the stand and say she didn't behave like the mother of a school shooter should behave is nonsense. None of them have ever dealt with the mother of a child, who, a teenager, who has just killed people and shot many others. There isn't a right way in any handbook to say how you should or should not behave. Trying to make her look selfish and callous goes right with that same thing. How she reacts is how she reacts. You see it on the screen. It's really hard to pass judgment, although these police officers did, on how a person should react when the, for the first time in their lives they walk out of their house and are surrounded with guns in their face. Or how a person re would react to be woken up in the middle of the night on a mattress with police around them and above them with guns in her face. So not only has anyone not been in the shoes of a school shooter and dealing with the kind of emotions that would come with that, they also don't know and there isn't a standard reaction for how you behave when you're surrounded with guns in your face. Jennifer's own statement provides reasonable doubt that she didn't think he would hurt other people. She typed to him, Ethan, don't do it. She didn't say, don't shoot people. She didn't say, don't hurt anyone. She thought the only thing on her radar that could be possible at that point, knowing there's an open shooter and he has a weapon, was that he would kill himself. Reasonable doubt can be found in Jennifer's testimony. Jennifer's testimony is evidence. And at the end of the day, whether you believe, like, hate, however you feel about her testimony, the defense didn't have to prove anything. You still have to evaluate the prosecution's case for what it was. However, Jennifer Crumbly did take the stand, and that was not easy for her to give you additional con context about what was going on in the shreds of evidence the prosecution cherry picked and put, put before you. The only person who's actually been consistent in this case, and you can find reasonable doubt from this, is Jennifer. She's consistent in what she says to police, what she says to her husband about things, and what she says to other witnesses who testified. You can find reasonable doubt in the fact that the police officers are very, very biased in this case. There is no doubt this is one of the most awful situation any one of them have ever been involved in. But it's also very clear, they have a narrative that Jennifer Crumbly is responsible and when they came in here and took that witness stand, they were gonna mess with me on questions that were so stupid. Like this ATF agent telling me he doesn't know if teenagers could lie. Everyone in the room knows a teenager could lie. That was a low ball. Just answer the question. 
When you have an ATF agent that can't even get on the stand and answer a question that's common sense, that should speak volumes. That there's a narrative they've been directed to get out and they have an agenda. And that agenda, ladies and gentlemen, is not positive for Jennifer Crumbly. Making this big deal about money and cash that Mrs. Crumbly took out is another reasonable doubt in this case. Mrs. Crumbly explained, her dad had accounts frozen. She didn't want her accounts to be frozen. Her dad put money in that day so she could take it out. Getting money out of the account that had her son's name on it wasn't done in any way to steal money from her son or show she doesn't care about him. She's the one that contributes every week from her paycheck into that account. And at the end of the day, she wants cash because everyone in the world absolutely hates her. She can't walk in places and hand them a credit card. Hey, Jennifer Crumbly's on that credit card. The only option she had was cash. She can't go in and start showing identification and things to get hotel rooms and the more cash she can use, the better. The less she has to risk that people are gonna figure out who she is. And remember, the world was essentially showing its colors against her as she was receiving threatening messages in the days that followed that shooting. On Facebook, from other people, in her emails, in her Instagram, everywhere. They're so threatening, her employer is making her shut down accounts. Her friends, people that have been her people for years, don't want anything to do with her and don't want to be by her because she's that dangerous at that point in time. So for her to want to have cash makes absolute perfect sense. That's not a sign she's trying to flee. And also, if you're trying to flee, you don't go around local Oakland County and areas surrounding it and carry around a syringe of horse medicine. If you're gonna flee, you abort mission on the horses. At that point, you're fleeing. It's very obvious Jennifer Crumbly, her intent was not to flee. Her intent is to stay safe. Her intent is to avoid threats. Her intent is to get this horse medicine to this horse, which obviously can't happen if she flees. It's clear when she's at the art studio that she's not hidden very well. She's outside smoking, her husband's outside smoking. We saw the evidence of the cigarette butts in the snow. There's commercials commercial buildings around and businesses within that studio. She's walking around taking a tour of the studio with her friend who owns it. And there's cameras all over the building. Obviously, she's not trying to hide if she's going into a building where you can see security cameras right on the outside that would document everything that's happening that we ultimately got to see in this trial. It's clear she's trying to stay the night in Detroit on November 3rd and didn't know where to go. It's clear from the video she's dead asleep at 1 o'clock in the morning when they're ultimately found and woken up to guns in their face. She testified she took four Xanax and so did her husband. We also saw evidence there was a liquor bottle in the garbage and presumably she had a drink. After four days of no sleep and not really eating, one can only imagine how hard four Xanax and a cocktail might hit you. So they make this big deal that there's text messages after 11 o'clock saying we might have been found. Well, earlier in those text messages that were admitted by the prosecution is Exhibit 430. The first text says, Marielle, this is Jennifer's phone, and Marielle was the other attorney at the time. Marielle, this is Jennifer's phone. James and Jennifer, James and Jennifer are using Jennifer's phone now. Next message, the other phone broke. 
And then there's a message to the Crumblies, when you can, we'd like for you to call us. That's at 619. Then at 621, thank you, Shannon's calling you both shortly. <clears throat> then at 702, I text, Marielle and I are going to come get you in the morning. We do not think it will help to make a statement that you're coming in or that it will be tomorrow morning. All we can say, as we've told everyone, is that you're coming back, and as of tomorrow, you'll be back. My next message says, we can show them that everything we've said was going to happen did happen. Because the crumblies weren't running. They just wanted to turn themselves in to a court. And law enforcement got on the stand and told you, that's something people commonly do. It just didn't happen in this case. At 7.03, the Crumblies write back, and we don't know if it's Jennifer or James because they're sharing his phone. Okay. Text to the lawyers that say Marielle Shannon lawyers. Who knows why they sent that? I text, I am going to drive to my drive home from my office right now. I'll give you a call in about 40, 45 minutes so I can get all of the bond factor information written down for you for Marielle and me. I'm asking for bond information so we can go to the court in the morning. Your Honor, I'm going to object. There's a prior ruling. She cannot Sustain. be a witness. That was already already dealt with. Sustain. Sorry, I thought I was arguing off the evidence they admitted. Well, you can argue off, off the evidence. Okay. So they say at 737, okay, we'll be waiting. I'm going to call in one minute, okay. Then at 1114 on the phone that both of them have been using a text to send to the lawyers. Think we might have been found, don't know, just a heads up, please check. It's not for a couple hours that they're actually found, but Mrs. Crumbly testified she didn't send that text and she was already asleep. Now, after those text messages, there's two more pages that are included in that exhibit. So if you do end up taking a closer look, at 4.30, which is totally fine. Just be aware that there's another thread that starts that's a repeat, and I don't know why that is. I just want to let you know um, know that, and I'm not sure why that exhibit is like that. That was a new one we got, obviously, all today. In the days after Mrs. Crumbly and Mr. Crumbly um, are planning to turn themselves in. We know they're planning to turn themselves in because Exhibit A was admitted, which showed they were trying to find a hotel in Auburn Hills on Priceline for December 4th and 5th in case they needed it for the weekend. <coughs> There's no doubts, and I don't need to go on and on about this, they were getting threats. That was so clear at trial. They were afraid to go turn themselves into a police station a police station where if they went, there would likely be other inmates or bad people there, and their faces would be up on a TV because it was all over the state at that point. They were terrified. They wanted to go in through a lawyer. Reasonable doubt can be inferred from the fact that they set an <coughs> alarm clock which was admitted by the prosecution showing that on Saturday they were getting up at 6.30 or 6.45, completely consistent with their plan to go to Novi for an 8.30 hearing. This is also not James's trial. I am not standing here suggesting that James is guilty of involuntary manslaughter in any way. But it is important to find out, to point out that James was the parent responsible for all of the storage of the guns. Jennifer Crumbly barely knew a thing about them. She would have didn't object to them being in the house. She didn't object to buying the gun that James and Ethan were interested in. She didn't object to calling it Ethan's Christmas gift. She was not responsible at <coughs> all for the storage of the weapon. It is misleading to suggest by the prosecution that that Sig Sauer case was open on the bed 
and that it sat open like that all day with the ammunition box next to it. It's very clear that when James and Jennifer Crumbly were on the phone during that seven minute phone call, <coughs> Mr. Crumbly was looking for the gun, found the gun was missing, asked Jennifer Crumbly, where's the ammunition, pulled it out, and set it on the bed. It's not like that gun box, that case, was just sitting out there open at all times. When law enforcement did get there, find it on the bed, even they moved it around to the kitchen counter and other places. While this is not uh, James's case, it is fair that Jennifer Crumbly would expect that he would have more flexibility in going to handle an issue at the school. That is not unreasonable and does not make her a bad mom. He's out in the Oxford, Lake Orion, Rochester area door dashing. She's the one with a professional career supporting the family and paying all their bills and trying to keep her job, which they may need to add the family on for insurance in this open enrollment period. She shouldn't be diminished as a mother because she was gonna let father go to the school and handle whatever issue there was. Now, ultimately, they went together. But he's a DoorDash driver. She's trying to pay the bills. She's the breadwinner. At that time, he's in between jobs. She shouldn't be dinged for that. It's misleading for the prosecution to suggest there's been evidence in this case. She keeps guns in the car. She didn't say she keeps guns in the car. When she was interviewed, and if you really want to watch the interview, you can, Jennifer told law enforcement there was one time that gun was in the back of her car. That one time was when James put it in the back of the car and she drove the car to the range. Her son and her had a experience at the range and she drove the car back home, left the car locked with the gun in it so that when her husband got home, he could put it away. It is not true that she was driving around keeping guns in the car. That is not what she said to police. As far as Mrs. Crumbly knew, there was a cable lock on the gun at all times. She called it a string lock. She testified that the key was kept in a separate place in one of the many beer steins they had. She testified that she did know where the ammunition was. She hid it in her <coughs> drawer of jeans. And she testified that things were locked and hidden separately, and that Mr. Crumbly was responsible for hiding the weapon. If you are upset with how the weapon was hidden, that's not your issue to decide. That's a future jury that will look at the case of James Crumbly. You're here to look at the case of Jennifer Crumbly and consider what she knew. She is not the person responsible for storing this weapon. I'm not trying to suggest she didn't know it was in the house, but she is not the person putting the cable lock on and off or doing anything with the gun. We saw her gun abilities when she went to the range and had to have her son show her everything about it. It's a gross overstatement to keep saying that the gun was his gift. It's very clear it was something <coughs> bought for him to use at the shooting range, something that may one day ultimately be truly just his. But it's just like any of us giving our kids a laptop to use, a cell phone to use, a car to use, a jet ski. I have a friend that has kids, they have snowmobiles. Nothing different. It doesn't really mean the kids just have free access to all of that stuff. It comes with conditions, rules, and parameters. Unfortunately, this is a case where the prosecution made a charging decision way too fast. It was motivated by obvious reasons for political gain and media attention. And we know that because on 11-1, when the shooter was arraigned, the shooter was on Zoom and so were the parents and the media was aware. And when Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly were charged and there was a swear to at the court, the media was all there, but guess who wasn't? Mr. or Mrs. Crumbly. Mrs. Crumley testified she didn't even know there was going to be an, an arraignment, but the media knew. And then the prosecution came out with a big conference, press conference, announcing it. 
I would submit that the plan was never to let the Crumblies turn themselves in, but to turn them into a big charade of looking like they're trying to flee when they absolutely weren't. The prosecution and law enforcement have approached this case with tunnel vision from day one. Brian Maloche called it a witch hunt. I would submit to you it was. And once they charged these parents and the ATF, Sheriff's Department, Border Patrol, Secret Service, all U.S. Marshals, not Secret Service, when all these agencies have gathered around and hundreds of people are looking for the crumblies, it's really hard to say, we made a charging decision a little too fast. And in this case, you heard evidence that much of the evidence in the case didn't roll in until after the parents were charged, arrested, and in jail. To try to suggest having multiple phones as a sign of fleeing is just garbage. I think everyone here clearly understands why they bought burner phones and why they went and bought replacement phones with their phone numbers so they could use two-figure factor authentication to get into their accounts. Jennifer Crumbly is seen in the police interview at the substation handing her phone to law enforcement when they're asking questions. When the police tell her they want to take her phone for a search warrant, she doesn't want to hand it over right away, but it's not because she's trying to hide things. It's because it's her only line of communication. She doesn't really understand how a search warrant works until her husband explains it. All of her contacts are in the phone. She doesn't carry around a little diary of all the numbers, although police do let her get the numbers out. <coughs> and it's the only way people can get a hold of her, and she's been in touch with them nonstop, as we can see when she's in the police vehicles. And again, although she's on her phone, and there is a substantial amount of time where she's looking things up, communicating with people, <coughs> trying to get things done, that doesn't mean she believed her son was a school shooter and had no emotions over what was happening. The prosecution has painted her out to be a person who lacks remorse, and I would submit to you that she would change everything if she could. And when she looks back and says there's not a thing that she feels she could have changed that would have changed something, you have to keep in mind that the suggestions by the prosecution are just ridiculous. Giving him a hug that day in the counseling office was going to stop a mass shooting? That's just ridiculous. There is nothing to prove that, that anything could have stopped a mass shooting when you're dealing with someone who is so manipulative and is a criminal and was a shooter in cold blood and pled guilty and took responsibility as an adult for his crimes. Finally, my last reasonable doubt card is blank because I've tried my hardest to come up with all the reasonable doubts the defense sees in this case. And like I said, each of you need only one to vote Mrs. Crumbly not guilty. But a lot of times jurors think of a reasonable doubt I miss because there's so much evidence. And we've already established and I've admitted I'm not a perfect person and not a perfect lawyer. So I put a blank card before you so that if you have a doubt I've missed, you know you're not limited to what I've suggested or the defense has suggested. You're welcome to come up with your own doubts on your own. And if you decide you want to dive in and read the truth between Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly and everything they talk about, you're totally more than welcome to. Those exhibits are all going back with you. And what I'll tell you is that you're going to find a lot of instances where Mrs. Crumbly is anxious, asking where her son is, where her husband is. You're going to see a lot, lot of horse talk. You're going to see arguments between a married couple. When I read them, I, they read just like my husband and myself, um, yelling and swearing at each other at times. And then the next message says, hey, what do you want for dinner? And then we just move on, and that's just how life is. Um, you'll see messages in here that will certainly make you blush when you read what Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly intend to do in bed that night. You will read a variety of messages that show real life 
in real life between two married people that have a child. And it should make no difference that they may use their horse's name more often than their son's. And I'd also submit that every time you see them talk about when is he going to be home and what are we going to eat for dinner, even if they don't use the words spelled E-T-H-A-N, that's who they're talking about because there are only three of them in that house. At this point in the trial, I am asking that you find Jennifer Crumbly not guilty, not just for Jennifer Crumbly, but for every mother who's out there doing the best they can, who could easily be in her shoes, for every parent doing the best they can, who could easily be in their shoes, for every parent that has snippets of text messages that could be read and make them look like horrible monsters. For every parent that has fights with their kid on text message that also could make them look like <coughs> terrible parents. For every parent that's ever had a hobby and has not spent 24-7 with their child. That should not be held against parents. For any parent that's ever had an affair or spent time communicating on an affair, that says nothing about how much you care about your child or your expectation of whether or not they would commit a school shooting. Most people who have affairs would still not expect their child would do this. I do wish more than anything this case could bring justice to the victims of the shooting, the victims of the terrorism that took place that day, and the victims of their families. I wish more than anything it really could be a result that would be a band-aid to make everyone feel better, but it can't be. First of all, it brings back nothing for the people who have lost. It certainly doesn't bring back any lives. And if anything, this is not justice. This is not how justice works. This case does nothing for the people who have already lost everything. Many of those people sitting in this, many of the people sitting in this courtroom. And it does nothing to bring back the tragedy and the tragedy that unfolded on November 30th. At this point in time, the prosecution cannot prove that Mrs. Crumbly avoided exercising ordinary care that would have saved lives. The prosecution cannot prove that Mrs. Crumbly was aware there was a danger that existed by her son that required her to exercise reasonable care. They cannot prove that she was grossly negligent and that there was any way she could foresee that this would happen as awful as it is, and we all stipulate it is. At this point in trial, I always have to sit down, this is how the court rules work. Prosecution gives a closing, I give a closing, they have an opportunity for rebuttal, and then I don't get to say anything else. And I'm sure you can see from my demeanor in trial, when the prosecution says something that I know I have an argument against, I get anxious, I, you can see a reaction, and I'm not gonna do that, but I am gonna tell you that as they argue, I will have many things that I wish I could get up and say, that's not true and argue again. So what I would ask is that when you go back in the jury room and begin to deliberate, you think about and ask yourselves, what would Shannon Smith have said in response to the rebuttal where they get the last word? I would just ask that you consider that in your deliberations, because I guarantee you I'll have a very hard time sitting here knowing that the prosecution gets the last word when I know the defense would disagree with it. And I am asking <coughs> each of you to vote that Mrs. Crumbly is not guilty because she is not guilty and because a not guilty verdict is the only fair and just result in this case. Thank you. Thank you.